Welcome to the December 6, 2023 meeting of the Thurston County Planning Commission. The Thurston County Planning Commission is a citizen's advisory committee to the Board of County Commissioners on land use planning matters, such as the comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance amendments. Planning Commission actions are in the form of recommendations to the County Commissioners who are the final decision makers. All Planning Commission meetings are open to the public. Citizens are welcome to observe all Planning Commission briefings and work sessions. We welcome public comment on those topics for which a public hearing has not yet been held. My name is Eric Casino. I'm this season's chair and I reside in District 2 and we'll start our introductions down here. Commissioner Halverson. Barry Halverson, District 2. Scott Nelson, District 3. Derek Day, District 1. Helen Wheatley, District 1. Kevin Festinger, District 1. And I don't think we have anybody else online, do we? All right, well, with that, I hope everybody's had an opportunity to look over the agenda, and if so, I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded to accept the agenda. I call for the vote, or is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Commissioner Halverson. Aye. Commissioner Nelson. Aye. Commissioner Pessinger. Aye. Commissioner Wheatley. Aye. Vice Chair Day. Aye. Chair Casino. Aye, the agenda has been accepted. Has everybody had an opportunity to look over the November 15th, 2023 meeting minutes? And if so, I have one. Uh, we have, I have, I have some one corrections to go through. We'll we start need with to make on page two, line 43. The word not just needs to be deleted. It provides the opposite direction of what the. Oh, okay. The bottom line is that both Kevin, uh, Commissioner Pesker, and I said that the. HOA bylaws cannot be okay. amended because of this law. I had a question about that same um, yeah. thing. Um, wasn't that, was that in reference to, or I remember there being some discussion of Airbnb situations. Yeah, and I was wondering so, if that was that part. No, mm -hmm. it was a separate oh, one. Okay. No. HOAs can determine whether they'll have it. B and B's and stuff in their neighborhood. It was listed here as short term rentals, but it was worded wrong. Where what line is that? Short, yeah. I, I know it came up. I thought it was there, but um yeah, there was some mention. On line 42 of page three. Yeah. No. Well, I, I want to correct that. It says Commissioner Peskin and Chair Casino asked whether homeowners with ADUs on their property are permitted to make any short term rental rules. We did not ask that. We asked whether jurisdictions are permitted to make any rules related to that. That's correct. Can we make that amendment to those two, Tasha? Yes. I have one from line 22 on that same page. It says, Commissioner President asked for commerce a stance on whether a missing middle will impact housing and how much of a difference it would make. Then it immediately goes into Chair Casino remarked. Um, there was an answer. Mrs. Hodgson answered that she felt it would be negligible to no impact. And I would like that recorded. I think that's a fair addition. Uh, Commissioner Wheatley, did you have any more? Yeah, well, I did. Um, it's again in that um, page three, uh, lines 39 to 42. And I didn't have time to go back into the record, but maybe I'll ask people what they remember. Um, it says, she also mentioned that a recent survey showed more people are interested in moderate density housing options. However, a significant portion of the population is still against it. It's that last sentence. However, a significant portion of the population is still against it. I wanted to go back and check the record because the survey, I, well, first of all, I think she was referencing the state uh, survey of housing that was done like last year, I think. Um, and it doesn't show that. I mean, so. I, I it, don't recall her saying that. I recall it her jumps saying at, yeah, developers were not like. Yeah, to jump I, it on would them. be it would be a very incorrect statement to say a significant portion of the population is against mod, moderate density housing. I brought all kinds of stats from that survey. Well, I and so, but I didn't have time to see if she had actually said that, but I don't think she could have because it wouldn't we, be we, accurate. We can verify. Yeah. We, we can go back and verify. Yeah. Um, In which case, just strike it. 
Uh, well, I, I think it'd be best to verify the the official audio said. record. Yeah. And just click because if it if it was exactly. mischaracterized, make sure that it's just correctly characterized. Yeah. So maybe we can ask for that um update and then do a uh um revisit these meeting minutes at the next meeting yeah. well it'll be a different planning commission oh boy <laughs> yeah that's the so problem. i mean i think you could just it, you could either strike it because you do have the audio recording as your official record or you could direct staff to would striking it suit you fine just strike it because it's inaccurate i don't it, recall their saying that at all does anybody have any objections to that okay any other updates? Well, I, I mean, there would be, again, and I'll just say it, that um, I had talked about uh, the survey and I had mentioned um, that it one of the questions that it addresses is couch surfing. Um, and in a way, I would have liked to have found where I put that because I would have liked to have put it in the record because I went and looked up the stats and I wasn't, I think I said something like 5%. It's actually... Six percent said that it, that they had couch surfed. Six percent of the respondents. Well, I, to the I survey. think that it is in the official record. In the record. Yeah, in the record. But I would have liked to have, um, you know, pulled it out. But I didn't have time to find where I would have had to listen to them. <laughs> it is hard. Yeah. We, I mean, we do try to provide a, a yeah. somewhat higher level summary because an hour and a half to two hour right. discussion would yeah. be but very it, long. It's a it's significant. I mean, where where we were talking about that, I think it was significant to have made that point, which is why I'm bringing it up now because because the the numbers in that you know I think I had been saying that it's really important to look at that survey because the numbers tell you things about how much people well, are struggling. I'm not sure where that's actionable and yeah. the acceptance of these meeting minutes though. Right. Okay. Well, I'm just getting it in the record. <laughs> One way or another. <laughs> Trisha Pester, you had something? Be nice to her. It might be her last meeting. Oh no. Yeah. What? I hope not. Well, it yeah. probably is. <laughs> yeah. Uh all right. Well with that, on these amended meeting minutes, is there a motion? Uh, I move to uh, approve the meeting minutes as amended and accept the audio as the official meeting record for 6 December 2023. Second. Excuse me. Excuse me. Moved and no. second. Any further discussion? For November 15, 2023. Thank you. It's been moved and second. Is there any further discussion on these meeting minutes? Then we'll call for the vote. Commissioner Halverson? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Abstain. Uh, Commissioner Pessinger? Aye. Commissioner Wheatley? Aye. Vice Chair Bay? Aye. Mr. Casino? Aye, and we have accepted those meeting minutes with five votes. All right. Well, with that, we will move on to the public communication portion of our meeting, and it does not look like we have anybody in the boardroom that would like to address the Planning Commission, but if there's anybody online that would like to address the Planning Commission on a subject that we have not yet held a public hearing, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and if you do, just raise your hand, and I'll call you and we'll promote you up so that way you can speak to us. I don't think anybody... Oh, there's uh, Stephen, is that Burnath? Stephen Burnath, we're gonna. Is it you the smart stuff that wrote us a bunch of stuff about forestry? Mm -hmm. Formerly of the Department of Ecology and State. That we've already held a we've already held a hearing on. Hopefully, has different advice for us. <laughs> yes. Well, there, there will be a. We'll be scheduling a board hearing, just so you know. Okay. If... Stephen, uh, you're up. You'll have to unmute yourself. Has he been promoted? Yeah, it's right there. Oh, there he is. Mr. Burnath, we can't hear you yet. You'll have to unmute yourself. I think his speakers are off. Oh, maybe he is unmuted. Going back and forth. Your microphone looks muted from this side. Now it looks unmuted. You're not muted on Zoom, 
but I think your microphone's not picking up. Uh, Mr. Purnath, we'd, we'd still love to hear your comments. So if you have an opportunity to email them in, uh, we, we'd still like to hear them or read them if you could, but I don't, I think we're having enough technical difficulties that it's not gonna happen. Is there anybody else online that would like to address the Planning Commission? All right, well, seeing nobody else, uh, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which would be a work session on Thurston 2045 Commerce Climate Presentation. And I think that uh, Manager Rye is probably gonna introduce this one. Yeah, so thank you. This is it's more like a study session, essentially, um, since we don't have any pending um, projects to bring before you, we thought we'd take these these unique opportunities to hear updates, um, like in the last um, meeting related to housing, and then this one related to climate. So, I feel really fortunate to have Sarah Fox joining us from the Department of Commerce. I'll turn it over to her, and then we also have Dana Bowers here from the Community Planning Team, as well as Rebecca Harvey, our climate climate program manager, um, here at the county to follow up after Sarah's presentation with updates about how, how we're doing in terms of um, our updates. Um, so Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah Fox. I am the Climate and Ecosystem Section Manager. Our team here at Commerce has been growing since I joined a little about two and a half years ago. And I'll talk a little bit about the history of the climate program uh, in this presentation tonight. So let's get started. First, I will talk about uh, where my program fits within all of uh, commerce, basically. Uh, so commerce, we do a lot of things. Uh, mostly, we strengthen communities through a portfolio of work that includes housing, energy, economic development, and planning. The climate program is part of our growth management services unit, which really focuses on providing that technical planning expertise to cities and counties. We also provide grants and uh, we assist tribes as well. So tonight I was planning to talk to you a little bit about the early legislative efforts and some of the actions that happened in the last two years. Uh, which led to our new climate law. Then I'll talk about some of the resources and tools that are available right now and the funding that's available. So I think all of you are very well acquainted with the Growth Management Act, but I like to just start here and just note that, you know, the Growth Management Act was started in 1990 in response to concerns that are uh, were then very pressing but, and still are about any type of uncoordinated, unplanned growth. And so it's really all about uh, providing a statewide planning framework to really address those concerns. It requires that local planning happens and that this planning is guided by state law and is regionally enforced. As we know, we have a lot of population coming to the state of Washington and we're expected to grow by about 2 million people in the next 20 years. And so there's a, a lot of planning that goes around that. And, uh, and I will get into the next piece. Um, one of the other pieces that is really distinctive with the Growth Management Act is the way that it is kind of regionally focused. So there's these variations on, on what is required in different areas of the state. Uh, we have on this slide, uh, I guess it's kind of that dark green, blue line, um, color is all of those cities and counties that are required to fully plan under the Growth Management Act, such as those in the central Puget Sound region. That means that these cities and counties must meet all of the Growth Management Act goals and requirements, and they must develop really detailed comprehensive plans. <clears throat> the orange, uh, in contrast, those uh, cities and counties that are shown in that orange area on the map are really the considered the smallest and slowest growing counties. Uh, they're referred to as partially planning communities, and they only need to plan for resource lands and critical areas. Why I'm kind of providing, again, this is kind of a backdrop, are some of the new laws and requirements and how they affect these different areas of our state and those requirements. 
the Growth Management Act has now 15 goals and policies. And as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about our newest goal. Uh, the goals are not listed in any order of priority, um, not prioritized by law. They each carry the same value and importance to our state, and they're all intended to complement and reinforce one another. As you'll notice, some of the goals use really soft words like encourage, while others are more strongly worded with some of those action words like reduce, maintain, and protect. All right, getting into the reason I'm here tonight, uh, the climate program. It really began with a budget proviso in 2021. Uh, they considered it to be a, a down payment on climate change planning uh, for a few different proposals of the bill. So in 2021, they proposed the climate law and it didn't pass. In 2022, they tried again and it didn't pass. Uh, meanwhile, they had the Department of Commerce and uh, state agencies really working on providing guidance and some incentives to really help with voluntary climate change planning. And so my team put together that guidance, led that, that effort, and we also provided an incentive grant program that was about two and a half million that uh, lasted for over the last year and ended in June. With the passage of the new climate law, this uh, the session, it was House Bill 1181. Uh, it actually added the climate uh, planning as the new goal to the Growth Management Act. And there's a few key changes that it happened. Uh, first, it requires that the new law applies to the 2025 jurisdictions first. Um, and those changes will go into effect with the submittal of their comprehensive plan and periodic updates. It also adds a greenhouse gas emissions reduction sub-element that's mandatory for those 11 uh, fastest growing counties and their cities and will require them to uh, include actions that will reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled. And this slide includes those 11 counties uh, and shows their implementation due dates. The bill also added a what they call a climate resiliency sub-element requirement that's mandatory for all jurisdictions that are considered the fully planning jurisdictions uh, that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, it also will allow a FEMA natural hazards mitigation plan if it's in substantial conformance with the guidance to be adopted by reference to satisfy the resilience requirements. House Bill 1181 has uh, several instances where it really talks about incorporating environmental justice, not just into a new climate element, but throughout your comprehensive planning process. Environmental justice is really a consideration that um, ensures that you're uplifting those that have been harmed first and worst by the impacts of climate change. Commerce will also be standing up a new grant program that will be available to community-based organizations to support their participation in the planning process. And we'll have more information on that in the coming months. Another new uh, aspect of House Bill 1181 is that it gives commerce limited approval authority over the climate elements that are submitted, submitted by cities and counties. Typically commerce, uh, at least the growth management um, unit has mostly been an agency that reviews and provides comments on submitted elements um, by cities and counties. Now it provides uh, an approval process that's that's voluntary. So if a county or city that is required to complete a greenhouse gas emissions reduction sub-element decides that they'd like to submit uh, the sub-element to the department of um, to our department for approval, a uh, few things can happen. Uh, first, if uh, the Commerce Department approves it, that sub-element becomes effective when it's approved versus being combined with the later adoption of the full comprehensive plan. So it would be independent of the periodic update cycle. Uh, if a city or county decides not to seek Commerce approval of the sub-element, the effective date of your greenhouse gas emissions reduction uh, sub-element would be effective on the date which the entire comprehensive plan is adopted. And let's talk a little bit more about some of the resources that are available right now for climate change planning. So we have, as I was mentioning, 
We've developed what we're calling early guidance. We have been working on it for the past two years. It's the goal of the guidance was really to provide options for a city or county of any size with any amount of resources to be able to develop climate goals and policies. This was in advance of any regulatory authority by the state. We just really wanted to make sure that it was uh, harder for a city or county to say no, um, because we would make this guidance so easy and adaptable to any, like I said, any city with any type of resources or level of understanding of climate change. For that reason, uh, the climate guidance has a few main components, and then I'll talk to you about each of the sub-elements themselves. The guidance provides uh, first starts with recommendations for creating a climate policy team. Uh, we're recommending that that could be part of your overall comprehensive planning team, um, but it's nice that if it was separate because you could bring in some uh, expertise from your community specifically that have climate uh, change experience. Uh, so you could have a separate team or you could integrate it with your overall uh, working group. And then we talk about the need for uh, consideration of public participation that's uh, early and ongoing throughout your entire process. That's really important when we're talking about climate and, and acceptance of new climate goals and policies. The third part of the guidance really focuses on each of those developments of the sub-elements. And so you'll focus on the resilience sub-element and the mitigation sub-element. And we'll, we'll talk about how we've made the uh, options really easy for any, uh, wherever you're at in the process of climate change planning. And then the final section describes how to really select the climate measures, uh, how to adapt them and customize them and ultimately adopt them into your comprehensive plans. Let's see. And then uh, just a final note on this slide, uh, by, uh, by law, Commerce must update the, this current early guidance and have it updated to reflect portions of this law by the end of the year, which we are currently working on right now. There's actually, we just uh, concluded a public comment period on those updates to the guidance and are, uh, we'll be, uh, like I said, working on uh, integrating those comments and having that, what we're calling intermediate guidance available by the end of the year. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the greenhouse gas emissions reduction sub-element and that guidance. Uh, as I was mentioning, we provided uh, three pathways for a city or county to choose. Um, the these pathways are really working on determining where your major sources of greenhouse gas emissions are. Uh, they discuss how to set emissions reduction targets. And then ending with, as I was mentioning, the final section of this uh, guidance overall is the how to select comprehensive greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals and policies for your plan. Pathway one depends on using a Department of Ecology framework that we call the eight questions to really begin developing a greenhouse gas emissions estimate, uh, which is based on more than anecdotal information, uh, provides some ideas on where to get uh, the type of information that you'll need to work on that uh, piece. Um, and then pathway two really talks, uh, focuses on reducing VMT and uh, where to get the VMT data, which actually the VMT data should be available for all counties and cities by the end of this year. This is something that Washington Department of Transportation is working on. And then pathway two, three uh, talks about uh, development of a local emissions inventory. Uh, the emissions inventory is kind of considered the gold standard. And because of this, uh, the Department of Commerce is actually uh, working on finalizing a contract with a consultant to be able to provide uh, emissions inventories for those 11 counties uh, that are required to provide a greenhouse gas emissions sub-element uh, by law. So we'll be rolling out those emissions inventories uh, this spring, especially for our 2025 jurisdictions. Uh, the resilience sub-element in this section of the guidance, uh, you will find, uh, again, uh, several, this time you'll find three steps that really talk about how to first explore uh, the climate impacts and provide a tool from the University of Washington to help you with that. 
Uh, it provides some um, guidance on auditing uh, different plans and, and policies uh, throughout, you know, that are within your city. And then uh, talks about an optional step three, which is doing a vulnerability and risk assessment and why, it, why it's optional or why you might want to pursue it. So it gives you some ideas around uh, the importance of that step and uh, it's something you might come back to. There's also ways uh, to do it, uh, vulnerability risk assessment kind of at different levels versus um, we, I, I'm trying to move fast through this, at least get the, but there is ways to kind of limit the scope of that vulnerability risk assessment um, versus doing a full has, you know, looking at every single hazard in the city. So that's uh, something you can take a look at. And then moving on to step four, this is really where we get into in those pathways and the choices that a city could make on on how what they can achieve again looking at what kind of resources you have and ultimately after you've moved through those steps and pathways again selecting the goals and policies uh, around resilience climate resilience and adopting them into your comprehensive plan So as I've mentioned a few times now, uh, Commerce has developed a menu of measures, uh, climate measures. It's a searchable database. It has more than 200 model goals, uh, climate goals and policies. Uh, this list uh, was developed in collaboration with uh, the six state agencies, um, about 80 different city and county planners that have joined us on this journey. And we had three different consultant contracts to really help with some of those uh, more detailed expert level um, inputs that we needed. Uh, this menu of measures will allow a jurisdiction to perhaps adopt a measure directly from the, the menu if, if it fits uh, if it fits the way you want it to fit. Otherwise, we talk about how you could adapt it to better fit your local context. Um, let's see, the menu of measures is also just a good starting place for conversations. Uh, might be something where you've selected several uh, measures to address a particular issue, and it's just a starting point for further conversation and study. Uh, you're able to take a look at this menu, like I mentioned, online. You can explore it by climate sector, by comprehensive plan, um, by by different attributes, like if it, you know, where it would fit in your comprehensive plan, like land use, economic development, um, transportation. You can take a look at a suite of measures in, in many different ways, same 200 measures, but we've sorted them uh, so that it's easier to, again, uh, review them and, and discuss them. Our guidance also provides uh, jurisdictions the flexibility to silo their climate element goals and policies either into a single chapter or, again, the way we've kind of sort, uh, provided this guidance is a way of, of you being able to also integrate them throughout your comprehensive plan. So when you look at each one of these sample climate measures, you'll notice that they could easily fit, like, like I was mentioning before, like in a land use chapter or a transportation chapter, just as well as they could fit within their own individual uh, climate element. We also, uh, can one I more- just, Can I quickly ask a question? Because I, sure. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question, I guess. What is a climate sector in searchable attributes? Could you just explain what that term means? Uh, yes. So a climate, so there's a few things that are happening all at the same time. I apologize for throwing out too much, too many terms. Uh, when we talk about climate sectors, we're talking about um, we're integrating a couple different resources. Our list of, of climate sectors aligns with the University of Washington's database when they uh, have they. They've listed 11 climate sectors, um, and now I'm blanking out on all of them. Uh, and all I can think about is comprehensive plans. So let me. Well, I they talk talked about waste management, water resources. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I just because I, you know, it's climate sector doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, yes. <laughs> I know all I can think of is like University of Washington, we have 11 uh, climate sectors. So let me, um, now it's taken its own time. I'm, I'm loading up, up our menu of measures and I can walk you through those in a second. Uh, let me come back to that. Well, even just um, a hint, uh, you know. Yeah, yes, like, no, um, no like we're ma ma mentioning, uh, okay. like waste management. Um, okay, um, yeah, uh, it's, yeah. Forestry, yeah, yeah, okay. Side there, okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, 
Where is oh, so one other aspect uh, that we've men been mentioning is we developed this menu of measures in collaboration with a uh, environmental justice focus and a lens by uh, bringing in a contract with the company Front and Centered. They uh, recruited members uh, from throughout the state to be part of this working group. And and so each of the climate measures that you look at, the we say measures as a goal or a policy, uh, includes some notes about how um, how that measure could have greater environmental justice potential. Uh, so those are also included as um, as more information on uh, on these measures. And the, one of the reasons we added all of this information into our menu of measures is uh, kind of going all the way back to our 2021 directive from the state, which asked us to prioritize actions that benefit overburdened communities that will disproportionately suffer from compounding environmental impacts. And that's about all they put in this list of things that they wanted us to do. So it didn't provide a lot of guidance. And so this is how we approached it by bringing in members, um, bringing in um, members from throughout the state to repre better represent this particular issue and, and give us um, some uh, counsel as we are working through this climate guidance. Um, and what are the other things? Oh, and um, as we were working through this, um, the prioritization piece, uh, you know, we had hoped that initially that we would have maybe, um, I would say, uh, level setting, we'd have um, a way to maybe numerically indicate a higher priority measure over another. And we were going to incorporate environmental justice as you know one of those numerical values. But working with uh, the, the working group that we had, they weren't really comfortable after a year and a half of, of working on this guidance to really add numerical values to each one of the measures. And so that's where we landed was having um, more of an environmental uh, justice potential um, narrative added to the, the menu. And then the other things that we did include, though, included uh, effectiveness, you know, how effective a measure could be based more on anecdotal evidence at this point um, and relying on the different experts that we had in the room. Uh, we also included a score for longevity if the measure was a long term or a short term measure. And then we had a list of co-benefits and uh, co-benefits were along the lines of um, whether or not the, the, there was any environmental uh, benefits such as, you know, like a tree, if you have like a measure around planting trees that would have a high environmental co-benefit, it might also have, um, a health co-benefit. Um, so we have a list of 12 co-benefits and I will look them up because tonight my brain is not working. <laughs> you want me to list any more co-benefits, um, the pieces that we've suggested that a local jurisdiction, like each county or city, really um, kind of move to doing their own work um, on these measures would include this list that I have showing on the on the slide, which is really uh, bringing together your own working group around equity and asking those deeper questions. And we've provided a list of questions uh, so you can really add to those uh, measures. Uh, you really need to look at the cost um, and feasibility of those that are really unique to every jurisdiction, and then whether or not you have that political support to really move it forward. So those are things that the state cannot answer, but a uh, county or city should be able to work on those pieces. And then getting to some of the resources we've put together, we've curated uh, a, a guide that has over 100 resources. It includes reports and uh, data analysis tools, videos, and model development codes. Uh, we, again, kind of sorted them for you so you can look at them in terms of a climate resilience resource or a climate greenhouse gas emissions reduction mitigation resource. So you could look at them either way. We also had a climate fellow as part of our team who did a scoring system that's kind of like what you'd find in a bookstore. And uh, so there's a star system that really is intended to be from the lens of a new planner or someone new to climate change planning and how helpful is this resource. So if it's a four star, then it might be very helpful for someone who's who's new to this topic. It might be very helpful for them to get their uh, better understanding. And then 
let's see, I think that's it. And I'll provide all these links uh, to your planning commission so you could search them online. And then the last piece I wanted to share was that we have um, we have funding available. I know Thurston County has actually applied for this funding, but we had a formula grant system, meaning that uh, we have a Climate Commitment Act fund um, that we're using, which is separate from the state's general fund. And we're able to allocate about 30 million a biennium to enable every single city and county that's required. So those fully planning cities and counties that are required to include the climate change elements into the comprehensive plans that they will be able to do that with. And we've uh, given them all uh, a set amount of funding. We've also allowed that funding to be utilized over about the next six years, uh, which means that uh, city or county kind of going back to where they could be in the planning process. We have some cities and counties that are far ahead of others where they might already have a climate action plan. They might already have, you know, climate elements in their comprehensive plans and all they need to do is update it. They could use a slice of the funding just to do some minor, you know, minor amendments, some, you know, some additional work, and then they could utilize the remainder of the fund that we've allocated for them for something uh, that will really advance one of those goals or policies. Um, so more of an implementation piece, which is pretty exciting actually. So we're looking forward to seeing more of that than, uh, than perhaps the planning side of it. But for those that are new to climate change planning, hopefully that will really help them um, move forward smoothly, do a very robust public participation process and, and uh, be successful in adding climate uh, elements to their comprehensive plan. And let's see if uh, I can get back to your final question. Um, maybe I'll stop sharing and then um, maybe my computer will be friendly to me and help me out with my mental block. There actually is a visual on the slide, um, the, the picture of the computer with um, measures policy action, and it, it actually does refer to climate sectors, so that helps. To oh, good. <laughs> yeah. so, are there any questions that I can answer? Um, Commissioner Alderson, you got something? Yeah, just real quick. So for Thurston County, city's population over 6,000, we're talking about four cities in Thurston County. Olympia, Tumwater, Lacey, and Yelm. Yeah. Okay. So do we have to, uh, are we going to partner with them and our uh, plan for the development of this climate piece since they have to do it during the same time period as we do? We discussed with them and we have put on the table that working together would be great. Okay. And um, so far, we haven't had any reciprocation. Okay. Yeah. I will say that, and Rebecca can speak to this more, but there is a regional group yes. um, already convened for the climate mitigation plan. Um, and so they will probably continue. Um, and then on the other side, there's really two buckets here to the climate element update. On the other side, ours will look a lot different. Mm -hmm. It will cities. because of our density of population in the rural areas. Our needs are just different when it comes to resilience. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so have any of these four cities developed a plan yet? I think they're all um, working on it. I think Olympia is probably the furthest along as far as I understand. But even as far as their comp plan work, it is really separate from that regional work. Um, they're, you know, we're all setting some targets together and doing some some of the work with the climate mitigation plan, like Ashley said, but each of those um, jurisdictions is taking their comp plan work pretty separately. Okay. Uh, and Re Rebecca, yeah, you want to say could you speak to the, the piece in particular about the VM, VMTs and where we might need to bolster the work that's already been done regionally? Vehicle mileage. Sure. Um, Hi everyone, Rebecca Harvey, Climate Mitigation Senior Program Manager. Um, well, okay, so 
as Ashley mentioned, we we have a collaborative, which is the county and the three northern cities, Olympia, Tumwater, Lacey. We've been working together on a greenhouse gas reduction plan um, that was adopted or accepted by resolution by three of the jurisdictions. Lacey actually adopted it into their comp plan by reference um, earlier, 2020, early 2021. Um, the plan has greenhouse gas targets that are joint or shared among the four jurisdictions. And we have been doing a greenhouse gas inventory every year back to 2010, um, which was done by volunteer work and um, TRPC did it last year. This year, the county is contracting to do the next greenhouse gas inventory. We're just getting started with that now. Um, the current best practice that um, the group we're contracting with, which is ICLE, they're a nonprofit that works internationally and has developed the protocols for greenhouse gas inventories. Um, the, the current best practice for VMT is to use Google Environmental Insights Explorer. Um, so honestly, I have not done a deep dive into that data source. It's new and recently developed and kind of the, the state of the art as I understand it, but I'm very curious what's coming down from the DOT and how much more finer resolution that's going to be than what we could get on Google. What I do know about the Google is it only provides VMT for um, communities with a population of at least 25,000. So I think Tumwater is just past that threshold and they're not, they wouldn't be broken down um, yet or for their city, but uh, my contractor is going to communicate to Google that they're at the threshold and see if we could get data for then Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater separately because we would for the comp plan update, we'd like to, as much as possible, parse out the cities versus the rural unincorporated and the smaller towns of the county. So we're just gonna look at, at how that can be done because it hasn't been done as of yet. Yeah, and I guess that, that was the piece that I remember you sharing is sort of, we, we do have a climate mitigation plan. It was prepared regionally but in terms of meeting the climate element requirements, um, being able to separate out the county from the cities. Go ahead, Commissioner Kelly. Uh, yeah, for the, and this is a question um, for the planning commission, but also for the public that is going to be um, looking at the, you know, proposed comprehensive plan revisions. I was kind of hoping we'd get uh, a little more specific information about what HB 1181 says, uh, you know, one really important question for the county is, what's the difference between what are the what the requirements are for UGAs, which in this case means all urban areas, not the UGAs the way we usually think of them, but you know, for the cities, um, there are differences between what they're required to do and what the counties are the unincorporated counties are required to do. Um, is that not true? And and where, what are some of those really significant differences? Sorry, you said, do you want, uh, you said it was a question for the planning commissioner. So do you want? It, for the, on behalf of the plan, I'm asking the question on behalf of the planning commission, but also because this is, I think, important for the public that's looking at this to know. So the question is, you know, in a rough way, because it kind of goes to what you brought up, what's the difference between what the county needs to do and what the UGAs need to do in terms of 1181? Since we have Sarah available, it would be great if we could that's, get that That's who, yeah, that's who my question okay. is. Fantastic. Yeah. Sarah, Thanks, do you Sarah. mind addressing whether there are different requirements for city, UGA, and then rural unincorporated under the new house bill? Uh, well, uh, for climate in particular, I'm not aware of that distinction anywhere in the bill for that you'd have that type of a distinction. They have a distinction when it comes to regulations on more of, um, I'd say, more size differences. So 
uh, when it comes to that greenhouse gas emissions uh, requirements, sub-element requirements, they distinguish who has to uh, comply with that element and um, maybe also to mention also uh, the transportation updates when it comes to, because we we're talking about transportation, uh, but there were some updates to the transportation element as well. Um, oh, by first, the counties, those 11 counties, including Thurston County, and then cities over the size that are over 6,000 in population. And so the cities that are under that threshold, um, you know, don't have that burden of doing the greenhouse gas emission sub-element. Um, and then they do have, I should have had the chart up, but um, they had some distinction even about um, cities of a certain size that are uh, outside of the 11 counties uh, that have that responsibility to update their transportation element. Um, so the the bill, I um, the bill didn't just create two, you know, two new elements. As I had mentioned, they had some other things that happened throughout it, like the environmental justice aspect, but it also updated um, many of the other elements. Transportation was one of them. Uh, they had, the, there's some changes in the land use element. There's some changes in the utilities element. There's some changes, um, you know, those elements are um, some of them, some of those elements like, uh, Parks and Rec and utilities are kind of considered those, um, they're not the mandatory elements, but if uh, the entire bill does kind of touch on almost everything um, within the Growth Management Act. Um, so it's a, I'm not sure if that totally answered your question, but um, <laughs> kind of going back to the yeah, distinction because... between counties and cities, there are differences between what a county has to provide in a Growth Management Act uh, compliant comprehensive plan and um, items that a city does. And one of the um, bigger distinctions with counties is that agricultural aspect of um, the rural planning element versus cities don't need to do that. But as far as House Bill 1181, it doesn't, um, there isn't that bright line. Okay, because I thought there were some things that cities had to do that counties didn't. And for instance, uh, and maybe my memory is wrong, but for instance, how it touches on capital facilities, like um, doesn't it require uh, a uh, inventory of uh, like a green, some kind of a green resources, inventory or something like that. I mean, there's some very specific changes to different chapters. And um, I was under the impression that there, there were in some of those very specific changes to the, to the elements of the, of the plan that some of them applied only to UGAs and some did not, but, you know, maybe I'm just misremembering. Uh, well, I, th I think it goes to um, the 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 regulations that are within the Growth Management Act, and going back to the capital facilities element is considered an optional element. So there were changes, and that House Bill eleven eighty one made, but those are um, that element itself is optional. Um, oh, okay. Uh, the utilities All right, element so you're is just, optional. You're addressing and, the required elements. Um, um, mostly, right. Right. Well, our guidance, you know, will provide is focusing. Our guidance focus is just on the entirely new greenhouse gas um, emission sub element and resiliency sub element. We do, um, pro, you know, provide an overview of the other things that have changed. But uh, typically, um, those the guidance for those there's usually like separate guidance for every element of the comp plan, if that makes sense. And so we're focused on the climate. Uh, changes versus um, uh, uh, commerce isn't hasn't made plans to like update our uh, capital facilities guidance. Um, I think that's on the list. I think we're also planning to update our transportation guidance in the next couple of years as well. Um, but I won't promise something that we haven't quite started planning for yet. But um, okay, well, I don't want to belabor it. So <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Do we have any other questions for Sarah? I just had one comment on uh, transportation data. This might be helpful for Rebecca, but uh, the Thurston Regional Planning uh, Council is doing a transportation retrofit planning project. 
and they might have access to some data that could be helpful for what you're doing. It's going to be focused on uh, transportation retrofit planning for environmental reasons. So. Oh, okay. It's good to know. Um, I guess I mentioned there was a question about uh, data available for the VMTs as well. And like I said, I'm pretty sure uh, Washington Department of Transportation will be providing um, that data before the end of the year if um, if they haven't been communicating that yet. Um, I've been on the phone with them almost every other week. <laughs> so um, that is something that um, I had heard. So here's me throwing out something that can be verified later, but I thought it was supposed to be for every city, um, every city, not just cities of a certain size. Go ahead, Commissioner Lee. Um, yeah, I had a, on a uh, kind of another topic, I had a couple of questions. One was, well, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, um, and I'm asking this because I know there are folks in the community who have been, because Thurston County has trees, and has mm -hmm. a forestry industry. And mm -hmm. because there's also a lot of interest in preservation of uh, prairie land and, mm -hmm. and soil, see, you know, sequestration. And we kind of had a bit of a false start as far as our climate planning here with the TRPC. Um, you know, there was interest in trying to find ways to quantify uh, sequestration capabilities and, and that, you know, that's scientifically really hard to do. Yes. Uh, but then that led to the question, um, is everything being captured well in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and in particular, uh, for forestry practices? Um, and so my question is, has there been, uh, an effort to revisit what the parameters of what's measured for greenhouse gases might be, uh, you know, are, are there any changes to that over the last couple of years? Uh, is there any planning to kind of broaden that? Um, well, I can tell you what we've been working on um, in the last couple of years. And one of them, as I was briefly mentioned, we had kind of some goals at the beginning of the project about two years ago uh, around prioritization and effectiveness and being able to provide something more, um, I'd say, you know, off the shelf, uh, like a value to each of the measures. Like this measure has uh, more value than another measure and that value would incorporate how effective it was for th things like uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also, you know, prioritizing some of those uh, co-benefits and, you know, there'd be a whole list of things and it would, it would equal, uh, like I said, you, as a city or county, would have a very clear idea of, of the measures that would be effective for you and for your community and, um, and you could set some goals around you know, what you'd expect to achieve in a certain time frame. That was a high bar. <laughs> um, we have, um, we have, we are finding, um, you know, there's being things that, things that are in, in development, like, uh, the department of transportation has hired quite a lot of staff and have put a lot of resources to that, uh, vehicle miles travel data set and setting targets. And so they've been working on that piece. That is, um, you know, one of the, the biggest things that we could do to really affect greenhouse gas emissions being the greatest source in our state is vehicle miles traveled. Uh, some other pieces, you know, that land use element that you were just describing, kind of, uh, we haven't finished that. Ecology has been, um, they've hired lots of scientists and they're, they're trying to uh, work on providing some sort of an equation on that value of, you know, what is that greenhouse gas emissions value or, um, you know, of a forested area versus, you know, an urbanized area, you know, what does that look like? What is the exchange, so to speak, on on values of if you preserved it versus developed it? Um, so those pieces are in progress for Washington State specifically. Uh, there's other states um, that we have looked at as far as, you know, have put forward different models on their own. That's, you know, very interesting. And, and actually, I'm, I'm hoping... Uh, in the next year or two to really develop a tool specific to Washington state to better capture some of those trade-offs uh, when it comes to, again, you know, uh, making good choices for our state as to whether or not 
um, you know, this impact, uh, we can we can mitigate for that particular impact or not. Uh, what do we need to do to really um, uh, you know, make progress on our climate goals? Uh, one of the tools we've looked at is there's a, in California, they've put together this uh, Cali mod tool. Um, it allows you to really take a look at, at kind of those choices uh, when it comes to, um, you know, it's a, more of a project-based choice model versus a municipal level model. And so those are some of the things we're looking at. Uh, so hopefully I didn't just go too far into the weeds, but uh, I felt that's kind of what you were asking is, um, is there anything out there right now specifically? Not that I'm aware of, um, but we are working on it. Okay, and then one final uh, somewhat related question uh, that you can answer probably pretty quick. Uh, is there any work on applying any of this to um, the requirements for best available science uh, when you're talking about critical areas? Mm -hmm. uh, that that's an uh, it, it. There is in House Bill 1181 uh, reference to best available science that's related directly to the climate resilience uh, element. So it talks about utilizing best available sci science. Uh, I don't have that right in front of me, but um, that is where it's referenced. Internally, uh, we were discussing whether or not um, we need to um, add that um, as a change. Uh, so, okay, a couple pieces, sorry. <laughs> um, we have a rulemaking duty uh, in the next two years uh, to work through with House Bill 1181. And so we've made a list of potential changes that need to happen to the Washington Administrative Code uh, that um, statement in House Bill 1181 about climate resilience and utilizing best available science is one of those question marks that we also have, whether or not uh, there needs to be an amendment to best available science to, to capture that, uh, to be more clear on how that applies to climate resilience. Um, you know, it could be perhaps as, as it is now, if we left it alone, maybe too narrow, leaf, um, too narrow. And it you know, might look like it only applies to uh, critical areas and not to um, climate planning. So that's a really good question and it's uh, top of mind. Thanks. Commissioner Pessinger. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate your work and I'm gonna ask some strong questions. Don't take it as anything against your work. I think this is fantastic. I just wanna go further. Um, First question, how many cities or counties or jurisdictions in Washington have declared a climate emergency? Either percentage or numbers? Um, I, I've, I don't know that answer. That is um, actually provided at the end of my slide, a resource to the Municipal Research Services Center. They've been tracking um, you know, different climate um, bills and, and uh, resources that have been adopted throughout the state. So that would be a good resource uh, to find that information. Do you have even a guess? We think it will be 10%, 50%. Uh, that's not something we're tracking. So I, I don't know. Uh, one of just a kind of uh, step back for a moment. Um, for the last two years, climate elements have not been a requirement. They've not been part of the Growth Management Act. And so uh, all of the jurisdictions starting in 2025 will have to include a climate element, um, but that means that uh, jurisdictions haven't been submitting climate elements for commerce to approve uh, up to this point. So 2024's um, jurisdictions likely will have climate element because that's part of the uh, Vision 2050 requirements that they have in their region, but um, it's not something that commerce has been tracking uh, because it's it's new. How do you respond to, I'm sure you hear from members of the public who say this is way too little, way too late. Uh, how do you respond to that? Uh, this is, again, something that uh, as we talk about the work that we're, uh, that we're doing here at Commerce is really, you know, we work for the legislature and are carrying out um, what they have made law. And so I don't have a lot of, um, I guess, comments on whether or not it's it's too little, too late at this point. Just uh, 
working with working looking forward and working with what we have yeah um I, I guess i'm frustrated about this i totally get that you've got to do what the legislator legislature directs um and i'm sure i should take this up with the legislators but uh still i feel like we ought to be looking at opportunities to do more, to be more aggressive in addressing climate change locally. I feel like, uh, I mean, I've heard a good phrase, which is we're not going to solar panel an electric car our way out of this mess. Um, I think that this reminds me of the governor's task force on orca recovery. Uh, which is to say there's lots of talk and everyone says at the surface level, <laughs> we want to save the iconic orca of South Sound, our resident South Sound orcas. Uh, but we're not doing anything beyond tip of the iceberg stuff to actually, like that task force listed out a hundred things we could do and we're like arguing about the top three, whether we'll even consider making minute changes and things. Uh, and this is the same thing. So, you know, we have our students, our youth in a growing numbers doing die-ins at city council meetings and county commission meetings about climate change concerns. They clearly in large numbers think we're not doing enough. And I just would like any advice that you have from what you've seen around the state on how we can be much more aggressive in addressing climate change. Uh, well, that's actually a, a question I can't answer. <laughs> so what I've been describing to you tonight is our minimum requirements. Um, so uh, there isn't any um, regulation that says you can't exceed uh, these requirements. And so if Thurston County wants to really lead the state in, in work on climate change, you certainly can. And the the grants that we've provided are actually some of the most flexible grants that I've ever seen, where, as I was mentioning earlier, um, you don't need to spend um, all of the funding on, on just updating your comprehensive plan to add a climate element. You could be advancing some of the, the goals and policies that you believe are really going to make an impact in your county. And so, you know, may, maybe the, I'm just going to use solar panels because that's the first thing, but maybe you need a study uh, that tells you, um, kind of does an inventory of all your public buildings uh, to really provide information on uh, which ones are ready for solar panels or what sort of, um, you know, uh, I'd say, you know, things that you need to do within your facilities to convert all of your, your buildings to uh, electrify your buildings, you know, and take get rid of uh, reliance on uh, natural gas or, or things like that, um, this money could be used for those types of studies uh, so that you could then uh, do the next step, pick up another grant uh, from a for actually purchasing and constructing the thing now that you know what it, well, um, know what it is you want to achieve and how to achieve it. So, um, so with that in mind, just saying Department of Commerce uh, at least the growth management services, we're all about helping uh, plan stronger communities. We don't have a big stick to say uh, you have to do, you have to do this, you know, and, and we, we're not being prescriptive because that's not our role in the state. I get all that. I'm trying to ask if you've seen any examples from any other areas of the state. Uh, well, the, when I mentioned the 2024 jurisdictions, you know, have um, have Vision 2050 that they adopted, um, that coalition coalition of of counties and cities uh, put forward climate goals and policies that they want to achieve, and their comprehensive plans need to be consistent with, you know, Vision 2050. Um, so, I'd say as far as you know, advance work and early implementers, that's, uh, that's a pretty powerful group um, moving forward with, with work in advance of the state, you know, saying you have to do, you have to do anything. Um, we have other, you know, examples throughout the state of other cities that have moved forward with, you know, early action plans, that sort of thing. But as far as, you know, a regional, you know, 
example, that would be one of them. Um, that resource I mentioned, MRSC, has a list of cities and counties that have been early adopters. So you could look to that as a resource. Uh, we actually, um, when I mentioned my the fellow, I, also it's um, maybe something I should have mentioned, but our team started with three of us. <laughs> so uh, when I say I come from the Department of Commerce, it's a big agency, but some of these projects have small teams. And I added a climate fellow that will be updating MRSC's website with uh, the data that we've collected over the last year, working with some of these early imp implementers, we, we call them. So we'll be adding that to their database. And so we're utilizing their resources and their map system to really keep that information up to date. So that, that could be useful for answering that question as well. Thank you for that. Uh, oh, yeah. on this. Just yeah. One last question, but go ahead. To follow up on this. I yeah. think, Sarah, you made a point. I think we should put a spotlight on it. The flexibility of these grants is really, really, really important. I mean, we can write all of the plans and policies and goals and you know, high-minded ideals. And as a planner myself, I'm a little bit cynical about plans because I've written a lot of them that just sit on a shelf. And the just thinking about where the effort is put for the climate work, you know, I would honestly think that the, we would want the county to put honestly a pretty light touch on the comp plan part of it and spend every penny available on programming to implement it. I think that would be the most prudent and way, like to Kevin's point, like how do we actually move this faster, further, better? Like that focus would be really, really, really important. Anna, did you have something? We we have an update on the grant. We have an update. Okay. I do. I would love for Sarah just initially, even though this grant is flexible, there are still parameters. And Sarah, would you mind just um, just really clarifying those parameters for this first round of funding? Because I've heard a couple of things that are conflicting with my understanding. And I just want to hear from you again what those parameters are, if that's okay. Uh, sure. Uh, the the confusing part, and it's really uh, because it's such a, a new thing for the state, is that our funding comes from the Climate Commitment Act. The Climate Commitment Act uh, is uh, allows us to carry forward funds um, each each biennium uh, versus our traditional grant programs that come from the general fund and um, most planners in the state are aware, you know, if you get a grant uh, from the general fund, if you don't spend it in that biennium, you lose it, it's gone. And if you're late on billing, it's gone. You don't, you know, you know it's just, it's ended. Uh, so with the Climate Commitment Act, um, we have a $40 million um, program that is going to be renewed each biennium that, um, as part of that, um, this first biennium, I've set aside $30 million and have a commitment to continue to set aside $30 million every biennium until they tell me I'm done <laughs> with this work. Uh, we have, as a program, um, assumed that our, um, the, the finish date would be 2029 because that is the last round of uh, counties and cities that have to implement the House Bill 1181. So why I mentioned that context is this first biennium, I only have $30 million that I can distribute in grant funds. I'm rolling that forward. So at the end of the six years, you know, I'll have uh, um, about 75 million. And why I say 75 million is because I've also set aside $5 million of biennium to um, provide to community-based organizations. Uh, what we have put out into the world when it uh, when we were um, letting cities and counties know that we've set aside um, funding for them is that uh, we have committed to fully funding the 2025 jurisdictions and 2026 jurisdictions. So if they came forward today, we know that we have uh, enough to fund every single one of those elig eligible jurisdictions and full if they need the full funding. Um, what else? Oh, so um, some of the things that we put forward were 
that the grant could be used and needs to be used for planning. Uh, we can't uh, fund it for uh, infrastructure or construction uh, projects. And so that could be a bit of the confusion out there. We can, we can fund updates to your comprehensive plan. Uh, we could uh, fund, as I mentioned, uh, some of those next steps. So, you know, funding uh, different goals or strategies around um, any of those climate element goals and policies. Uh, they, If you're going to be asking for funding for that uh, next step, uh, you need to point to your comprehensive plan. And that might be why, where your staff's coming from. You, you need to be able to say you have a goal or policy that relates to that next step uh, before we can fund it. So if, uh, if you need to amend your comprehensive plan this round and make sure that you have you know, an overarching goal or policy that will, um, that you can point back to and say, this is why we're, we're doing this. And, and that, that might be why your staff saying, well, wait a minute, we still need to update our comp plan first. Uh, but, uh, the funding, like I said, is, is available. <laughs> now I feel more comfortable making my announcement. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I, I think that that framing is very helpful. Yes. <laughs> so, um, we, have a total of um, $800,000 that are allowed to be spent until 2029, exactly because of knowing that we have done a lot of work in the planning section and don't have a climate element yet. We know that that, even though it's a lighter touch, still needs some robust work. So we um, set aside, or I guess, allocated $300,000 to finish the comp plan work and $500,000 to do the implementation planning work. So definitely the bulk of it is in this section. Oh, oh good. Okay. Yeah, no. but <laughs> we, we definitely need that consultant to pinpoint where our gaps are to do the VMT studies at the right granular level. And I know Rebecca could talk more about sure. that in a different setting if, um, if that would be helpful. But then also, you know, some of the different studies we have available or that we have on the scope you would point to that. Really check with uh, TRPC about what work they might be doing on VMT. Yeah. Already done it. We are. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, so I, I would say the bulk of that funding, yes. if you are yes. going to parse the 300, is actually on the resiliency side. Yes. So there's been a lot of regional effort on climate mitigation, but as it relates to resiliency for county facilities and our natural resource industries and things of that nature, there hasn't been quite as much work. Um, but I will say it's a it's an extremely aggressive schedule. And so even when we started off sort of scoping like what we wanted to do on the climate resiliency side, well, we're, we we're gonna be scaling, scaling back to like, okay, we have a natural hazards mitigation plan. We have a flood hazard mitigation plan, and really doing it that gap analysis yeah. and building on those instead of starting from scratch. Yep. And then reserving as much time as possible. And just giving ourselves that time after this comp plan amendment in 2025 to dig into those plans. And I certainly don't hope that takes until 2029. I hope that we can, uh, but, you know, studies take some time to get the right data and information. So yeah, and think of things point. like updating your capital facilities plan. Yeah. And it's not necessarily more comp plan work. It's more like, okay, you start pointing out to pointing out to other plans that need to be updated um, that will help with that implementation piece. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get back to Commissioner Pestinger. One last question for Sarah. Uh, on the environmental justice stuff, slide 11, slide 18, uh, there's talk about overburdened communities, mm -hmm. which I think in some cases have been viewed uh, uh, as a, a racial question. And in other cases, that's just clearly poor people are been overburdened in these situations of all races. Um, how does I don't know, is this the legislature? Because it was a quote from the legislature about overburdened communities. How does the Department of Commerce define that? What, what is that group? How do you identify that group? Uh, yes, actually, it is a new definition in um, in law. So they've, def they've defined it. Um, and that quote was from the um, 
uh, budget uh, that uh, that I, that I had as a as a as part of my guide on how I was um, instructed or directed to include environmental justice into our work. Um, so that that was from that um, directive. But the law updated was updated to include a definition. But where we uh, where it points to is an online um, data set that the Department of Health has developed that has a uh, environmental uh, it's the environmental health uh, hazards map. I feel like I just called that the wrong thing, but it's a DOH's map online. And um, when you take, when you kind of explore that map, that, the environmental health disparities map, that's it. Um, yeah. You have, um, bringing up. <laughs> oh, you're bringing it up. Okay. Oh, I brought oh, no. it up a lot when we were talking yeah. about one of our UGAs. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You can explore that map and, and what they're really focusing on are those um, high index areas. I think they're eight and nines. Um, and that, when I mentioned pulling together a group of individuals to help uh, inform and advise us on our environmental justice work, uh, we specifically recruited from uh, in uh, areas in the state that were the eight and nine areas. Uh, so it's it's a combination of factors that gives them the high score. It's not just economics, but it's it is like um, things like air quality and um, uh, you know different things like heat index and they have they have I forget how I think they have uh, they have multiple things that uh, play into that um, the health, you know the health um, aspects of um, of those disparities. I think infant mortality is one of them or right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. I had a follow up to that actually, if you're done. Go ahead. And that's because we haven't talked too much about this one. And this may be the last question. It's more directed uh, to the county. Um, uh, the slide, I forget the slide number, but climate planning guidance uh, talks about climate policy team you now and, and recommending putting together a climate policy team and all of that. Um, and I think that's uh, in direct reference to the GMA. I'm not sure. I mean, it references HB 1181. But my question is, again, and this is a question I'm asking you know, on behalf of the general public that takes an interest in this, what do you consider to be, uh, to fit this definition of a climate policy team? Um, do we have one? How do people get onto it? Uh, and especially if you link that to the justice dimension, you know, is there a clear path for people who want to be part of that conversation um, to become part of that conversation in the public participation sphere. Yeah. Sarah, do you mind addressing what the requirements or definitions are around it from a state perspective? And then we can chime in with what we're yeah, planning 14. for public participation. Uh, well, first, it's not a requirement of House Bill 1181 to have a climate policy team. Uh, as I was mentioning, our guidance was developed in advance of, of the law. And so our the guidance available right now, I, I consider it the voluntary <laughs> version because uh, we were really writing it uh, with the lens of trying to bring um, every city and county in the state, um, you know, bring them into the circle of being interested in and in doing climate planning. So we wanted to have many inroads to it. Um, and when we suggested a climate policy team, it's, um, I think we even mention it in the guidance itself, but uh, you know, some communities don't have a lot of you know, staff, so the staff resources are kind of low and, and asking them to have multiple uh, committees forming around their comprehensive plan update, that could be a really big lift. So uh, for those, maybe you wouldn't have a separate climate policy team, um, but typically, you know, more resource counties and cities, they tend to put together several, you know, maybe ad hoc committees even uh, to like work on some of those initial um, pieces of, of visioning and, you know, developing your scope of work and those things uh, as yeah. you're working through the beginning phases of your comp plan. So we were suggesting that uh, if you have those resources um, available to you, that you would include a climate policy. Uh, right. Committee. Yeah, that's, that's, I wasn't, I wasn't really directing it towards you for that very reason. Oh, I was directing okay. it towards, towards our folks here because 
we are, you know, we have the TRPC, we've had this whole kind of climate policy planning thing. And I guess, you know, embedded in my question is, are we basically going to point to the TRPC and say, that's, that's the team, because it's not, it's, it just seems to me that that's not enough. Um, I think it's part of the team. Yeah. So um, that was my question. Is yes. what, what do you? What are your thoughts about yes. this? Sorry, I wanted Sarah to chime in since you you mentioned whether it was a requirement, and so I just want a clarification okay. for the public that it, it isn't. Um, mm -hmm. We we ha we do have long history of involving the community in work around climate mitigation planning and climate adaptation planning, and so I think that building off of that rather than supplanting it or asking folks that, you know, are already working. Um, well, and, and Rebecca can talk about the advisory group that's been pulled together most recently working there and then also working on a separate thing over here. And then the cities are also probably going to have um, ad hoc stakeholder work groups. Um, I think we're still toying around with the best approach, whether it's an ad hoc group that we pull together for a series of meetings or I know we had discussed here even whether we have a larger Robust, one to two day uh, workshop yeah. where we could have more people participate that might not be able to participate in a series of six to eight advisory group meetings. Um, we have started conversations with our jurisdictional partners about the value in you know, teaming up to do these a larger workshop format where we can have more folks at the table. Um, and aligning with the rest of our outreach structure for a comprehensive plan, really making sure we're going out to the community. Um, I think Miriam did a great job of explaining like a lot of our outreach and making sure we're going out to the community and those vulnerable groups or the um, overburdened. overburdened groups. Yes, that to use the proper term and engaging them at that level rather than over overburdening them further to ask them to come to a separate meeting. Yeah. Well, I, I guess really weighing, weighing those, weighing those pros and cons. Yeah. And it's probably but, a balance between both. Okay. Because I mean, I guess I just want to highlight this is, this concept is about, um, it's about having a team that's uh, sort of um, at that level of bringing its expertise Climate expertise. It's climate expertise, and the and I guess my concern is that it would be easy to fall back on saying, well, we've done that with the TRPC, uh, you know, and with with you know all the work that's gone into it so far. But when you bring in this climate justice element, that's not enough, and it isn't it isn't necessarily the only right way to think about what this climate policy team would look like. And so I guess I'm trying to bring that forward because um, the question of who gets to participate in these conversations about climate and environment and um, impacts on on the you know on the population of Thurston County um, this is one of those areas where there sh there needs to be a lot of transparency about how that fits into the planning process um, and I guess I would just, you know, sort of raise like at the last meeting you mentioned uh, that that you talked to members of a an environmental policy group um, that's sort of an informal group that the county meets with. You know, would they be considered part of that? That's not a group that, that the public knows about and can say, I want to be on that. That's like something that they decided, you know, it's not it's they talk to you, you talk to them, but the rest of us don't know who they are or what you all are talking about. So, um, which I'm not happy about anyway, but, so uh, are you but you know, so, so I guess I'm just bringing this forward. If, if there is this concept of having some kind of, and it is, I hear what you're saying about, you know, there's all kinds of teams developing all around this for all the different jurisdictions, but I'm talking about the county, mm -hmm. you know, for the county, um, are you thinking about doing this in a way that isn't, um, that is creating a team that people can know to ask to be on? Um, and TRPC isn't that kind of a team at this point. 
No, I mean, and, and when I look at past work that has been done and who's participated, I would say that when you think about resiliency, voices that have been missing from the table are our natural resource industries that are facing the mm -hmm. impacts of climate change and trying to figure out how to be resilient today. And there's a lot of work being done in those areas, and it's not necessarily reflected when you look at the climate mitigation plan or the climate adaptation plan. So I would say that, yes, we are definitely thinking about in addition, and I'm just using that as an example, I was the ag program manager. So <laughs> that's the hat that um, I'm most familiar with. But to your point about thinking about voices that have not necessarily been pulled in or are reflected, but they are being impacted. Yes, we're thinking a lot about that, but forming a team might not be the best way to engage that particular audience. Right. So it's really designing, designing an engagement plan that we're, we're trying to meet people where they are and there's going to be it's going to be multifaceted um i don't think there's going to be one engagement opportunity that's going to work is, is there, talk about public like is there public. a way to make it clear that those are going i mean is there a way for people who are interested in these issues to know who you're talking to what you're thinking about how you're formatting those conversations so that's all in one place so that there's the kind of transparency that, you know, that is supposed to be happening with the public participation planning around the GMA. So like copies of, because I mean, you mean like presentations, like the Thurston 2045 presentations? Well, I mean, is there a place, if you're concerned about these issues, how can you know who the county's talking to and in what kind of form? Are you talking about in advance? Because it all yeah, goes or in, just in, you know, we, like we have a model for this already. Yeah. I mean, so one of the models that we had was in the early days of the Shoreline Master Program, we had a science technical <laughs> advisory group, and that was a lot of the people that do this kind of thing professionally. And then within that, there was what they called the small group, which was a lot of um, concerned citizens and community groups that were then invited to be on that. And that was actually my first foray into SMP was getting on that small group. So that way I could have a seat at the science technical advisory group to have my input on it. If that's the kind of model that you're thinking about doing for this, I think that is probably a moderately effective way of doing things. But you know, I don't, I don't know if you guys actually put together a plan yet on how you want to set that up. We're, we're waiting to get a consultant to help structure. I mean, so that, that's why it hasn't been finalized. It's not that we are not thinking about it and are getting ideas. But in addition to that, I guess I, I want to make sure that I'm addressing this concern of transparency. I mean, we document all of our presentations and they are included in the public participation You're, you're familiar with the group that meets privately with Josh. I mean, the, the resident advisory group? Yes. So are any of their meetings and discussions documented and available to the public? Uh, I could check to see. I've looked on the website. I can't. Find yeah, it. I mean, I don't I don't know if they're made. Like, I don't know if they're like there are published minutes or anything, but there are no decisions made in those. They're just they're people asking questions or answering. You're them. asking about transparency. That's yeah. what we're talking about. OK, I was wondering what group you were referring well, to because there's in particular i'm just concerned that if you know if somebody wants to have impact they need to know they need to understand the structure by which the county you know how the county's thinking you know what what connections the county is making and that needs to, that needs to be transparent especially if you're not going to have the model um uh the the commissioner uh, the chair casino was just talking about if you're not going to have that kind of a model what is it and how does the public know what it is? So I guess- but, my... Can I just speak up real quick yeah. and provide the context on uh, the community advisory work group? It's related. It's not directly answering the question, but do we have time? Please. Okay. <laughs> um, just to your, point, to your question, Commissioner, um, about the TRPC's involvement, the TRPC is no longer directly involved in the Thurston Climate Mitigation Collaborative. We just signed a new interlocal agreement. Now that we all have full-time climate staff in the four jurisdictions, we're leading the collaborative and then we have an executive committee of elected officials. Um, and we just yesterday actually had the first 
meeting of our new community advisory work group. And we did um, a lot of outreach, sharing, posting of the um, application. And we received about 50 applications for 10 spots. And so they're I'm pretty proud of the job we did, honestly, and get and we've looked very much at lived experiences and diversity of experiences um, rather than having people fit into a predetermined slot. We looked at the applications with trying to get diverse perspectives of community members. Um, so I just want you to know that that's happening um, and is just starting. And the community advisory work group for the climate mitigation plan will be meeting every month and communicating with the staff team and with the um, executive committee as well. Um, the fact that we had you know 40 more applicants who did not were not selected because we didn't have that many spots indicates um you know possibly a list we can go back to uh, to to start to um you know, contribute to public comment on the comprehensive plan um or possibly a team and i look forward to talking with my colleagues more about how to put that team together if we decide to go that route um and I was going to say one other thing, and I lost it. I just wanted to interject, too. I put a couple notes in the chat, and the last one I just put was um, when we we're talking about um, having some guidance around how to, you know, create um, some meaningful engagement around environmental justice. We actually included um, one of the deliverables from Front and Centered and that um, that team of individuals that we convened was putting together some guidance. And so that includes some ideas on how to, how to effectively engage with communities that are considered to be, you know, overburdened and also, uh, you know, some short and long-term strategies and, and uh, some communication ideas on, you know, what, what's most effective and things like that. So uh, we, we tried to keep the guidance short, you know, the, the planning and element side of the guidance short, but our appendix actually includes multiple different resources. And that's, that's the first one. Thank you. So, and I remember the, the one other point I was going to make was just that the community advisory work group um, is, is multi-jurisdictional. It's meant to represent the um, community or provide community input into the multi-jurisdictional plan. So we are not planning on going back to that group with a lot, like a deep dive into every comprehensive planning process, because that would be four separate comprehensive planning processes. But there might be a way to, at a higher level, to the extent that the county and the cities might align on some of that process of working, of bringing that group into um, the discussion. Thanks. Thanks. Does anybody have any other questions for Sarah or Rebecca or on this particular issue? Well, do we have anything closing with this portion of our meeting? No, other than the takeaways for us are that um, we, we just found out that we were awarded the grant based on the scope we submitted. Um, we also just closed the RFP um, last week for the comp plan update and we did receive three proposals. That's a huge relief. We were actually worried <laughs> that we would get any. Um, so the fact that we have three competitive proposals um, is reassuring um, and they both, all the teams include um specialists um in the climate arena well well respected ones so we'd be ex excited to get them on board and help shape um what the public participation is going to look like um what their level of involvement is going to be so i'm sorry we don't have all of those details tonight but we didn't really want to do it in a vacuum without basically a, a big portion of our team um especially because we were hoping and it sounds like they've had experience doing this work elsewhere um, with some of those 2024 jurisdictions um, working on Vision 2050. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the just 
we're continuing to make progress um, in the background and appreciate that the, the state was willing to come and hang out with us on a Wednesday night and provide some context. Thank you very much. Oh. Yeah, thank you for having me. And if there's other questions that come up throughout your process, feel free to call us. I listed three names at the end of my slide presentation. Uh, so my contact information is there. Michael Burnham, he is uh, leads on the policy side of the work and he'll be updating the guidance moving forward. And then the third name is Noelle Madera. She will be, uh, she's leading on the grant um, implementation. And so any questions around the grant, uh, definitely send them her way. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rebecca. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. So, all right. I, sorry, we'll say Michael lives in my neighborhood and I see him at school pick up like multiple times <laughs> a week. And it he's it would be great if you haven't spoken with him to have him do a more follow up deep dive as we get into policy discussions. So Fantastic. I'll start planning those seats with him. Great. Thank you very much. Well, with that, we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which would be staff updates. Oh, yes. Oh, while she's doing that. Don't mind her in the background. Um, <laughs> you can't see her. Um, yeah, so we're fully, we're going to be fully staffed as of January 1st. We haven't been fully staffed like this whole last year. So that's exciting. Um, and I know some of you were here when we announced who our new um, agriculture program manager is going to be, but it is going to be a gentleman by the name of Kevin Hansen. Um, Jensen, I'm so sorry. Kevin Hansen's our hydrogeologist, Kevin <laughs> Jensen, um, who is a what fourth or fifth generation Thurston County resident, South Thurston, operates a ranch with his family, has 10 years of experience doing regulatory compliance for the Washington State Department of Agriculture, um, and has pretty much enrolled his ranch, I think, in almost every conservation program available in Thurston County. You're probably familiar with him through um, Thurston Conservation District. I think he's been on the last, I don't even know how many legislative tours. Um, so we are really excited to have him join us um, in January. Um, I think it'll be a real asset as we talk about how to balance, you know, conservation and agriculture viability. Um, I also wanted to let you know, um, I think there was a question about an update regarding conversations with the tribes. Um, and so Maya sent me just a quick summary. Um, we have had our first meeting. They had requested um, essentially monthly meetings with representatives from the different tribes um, here in Thurston County with our staff. They identified what their priorities were and then also um, let us know their preferred level of engagement. Um, and so probably doesn't come in as, as a surprise, but their priorities include environmental, natural resources, transportation, and land use. Um, they also are very interested in water rights and watershed planning. So we're doing the legwork to try to figure out how we can dive deeper on those issues as we talk about housing, um, in particular, forecasting rural wells and the impacts um, to salmon. Um, they, we already have sent out some of the chapters so that they can start providing feedback early. Um, but essentially what they've requested is as we draft policies, they would like to look at them before we do broader stakeholder outreach um, on those particular chapters. And then following, so it'd be staff draft, um, give opportunities to the tribes to review, um, do broader stakeholder engagement, and then bringing it to the planning commission for that broader public review. So that was their request and we'd like to honor that. Um, so just wanted to make sure you have that. Um, and then for those of you that had other things to do at 3.30 today, um, the, <laughs> the consultant that uh, the county hired to do the industrial land study gave their presentation to the board. It's, it's long, it is full of information and data that I think will help the planning commission um, as either citizen initiated requests come before you or fingers crossed we get funds in the future to do an update to the economic chapter. It's definitely worth a watch, if not at least worth a perusal of the study. It is online. I'm happy to send out a link if you'd like. Was it YouTube? 
it was it was YouTubed. Um, and I mean, it's it's a pretty dense hour and a half presentation, but really walking through. I mean, you can. I have read the document, and I still found the presentation very helpful in terms of highlighting highlighting the that connective tissue between all the different sections. We have a, a link on the community planning webpage also to that. We, we're going to put a link. It probably is, hopefully it'll happen by the end of the week. Um, but we were, we were just talking after the briefing of, okay, now what, now how do we update the, the website so that we can make all the information available? Sounds like it'll be information that'll be useful for years to come. It will. Um, and they, uh, they through their work, essentially developed a, a tool that if we do have funding um, and resources, we'd be able to update. Um, like our economic development manager probably wouldn't live with us at that point, um, but it could be a tool that EDC could use. So um, I think that's it. Other than we really want to thank you. And I know that there's some coffee over here that probably isn't even hot anymore. That <laughs> Commissioner Whitley, <laughs> <Wendell, laughs> um, it's not a lot. <laughs> I wish I could do more than buy you all a cake. <laughs> but is it okay, Chair Casino? Oh yeah. If I slice up some cake. <laughs> yeah. While you guys finish your. Well, we fight off diabetes. Yeah. Oh, well, he's the one who said chocolate. He, I saw him last night and I was like, you get to pick the flavor. And he said chocolate with vanilla frosting and they didn't have one with vanilla frosting. I asked, but it's got Boston cream, some kind of Boston oh, cream good. vanilla filling. So hopefully yep. that meets your requirements. Yep, you got my heart. Um, <laughs> so you can blame Commissioner Halverson if you don't like it. Well, thank you very much. Well, I guess we should talk about eat, eat cake. We'll we'll also uh, then talk about our calendar then, and it is my impression that we we do not have anything for December twentieth, do we? Nope. Okay, so we can officially notice that the December twentieth meeting is canceled, which I'm sure nobody will break nobody's heart. Break nobody's heart. Now. I'm kind of under the impression that our January 3rd meeting might not be. Just to be clear, I canceled that meeting about 12 months ago. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't expecting you either way. Does the staff believe that uh, there would be anything going on on the 3rd, or do we even know if the new planning commission will I be appointed by them? I don't know. If, I mean, the hope is whoever has submitted their applications, the appoint their We'll talk the board it. is supposed to take action on the 12th at their meeting on the 12th, but I don't know if we're going to have a, a quorum. Like, we, I don't know if we'll have six to have that January 3rd meeting. So, so I would like to hold off on, okay. And then, and then the next meeting in January, um, it'll probably be training. Yeah. Okay. Onboarding. So we're not canceling our, our January 3rd meeting yet. That happens. Yeah. yeah. That's what she's recommending. You know, I, I was right. I, yeah, I don't You're think, I think, January 3rd? I think, yes, I, I don't know if we'll have. Okay. So let's put out a notice that January 3rd meeting is also canceled. Oh. <laughs> this is the most ridiculous. <laughs> I'm sorry. And then I, can use two I guess we should talk about, um, if you guys, who's coming back or who wants to come back, obviously none of us make that decision ourselves. That's something for the board to do. And if you do want to come back and have not applied, uh, probably need to get going on that pretty soon. Um, I, I had talked to Commissioner Simmons earlier, and at that point he was saying that he was not going to reapply and that he was going to retire off the Planning Commission. Um, I think many of the rest of you are thinking the same way. Um, I, I wouldn't, I would think that it was a shame. It'd be great to see everybody come back if they could, um, but put in your applications, put in your applications. Are you going to put in your application? Did a long time ago. It's already oh, there. you did? There's four of them that are currently, and I talked to the commissioners last night. Okay. They're wanting the rest of them. Christian <laughs> and Nelson, have you put in an application yet? I have. Okay, good. First day. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Hopefully, um, 
probably the commissioners will be able to take some action on that at their December 12th meeting. And then we will all be back here on January 19th or January 17th. The first meeting. Does anybody else have anything for the good of the order? Oh, I do. I'll just share. Yeah, we'd love well, to hear a quick story because everyone loves yeah. them. Is this about happens, Portland? That extra? Sort of. <laughs> sort of. Um, <laughs> going again tomorrow morning. Uh, no, well, my my dad uh, lived in Vancouver, Washington, just across the river from Portland, and he was college roommates at Clark College with the guy who started the first Earth Day in 1971. Guy that killed Dennis his girlfriend? Hayes? Yeah, Dennis Hayes. Uh, no, not that one. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, what was that? Just two years ago, we were screaming, my God, do something. And uh, I started working for the Department of Transportation in 1983. And we would sit there having these great conversations about how we were going to use federal highway dollars to build internet infrastructure so that we, you know, the internet wasn't even much of a thing in 1983, but we were going to build infrastructure because it would get people to be able to work from home and save commute trips and transportation, and, you know, expenses for highway expenses, environmental expenses of cars on the roads and all of that. That's 30 years ago. And I wouldn't say we've done well since 50 and 30 years ago. We got we got some shit to do. <laughs> so uh, I'll just keep pushing for that. Well, it was funny when she mentioned Vision 2050. I popped open the website and it was like, how does this differ from Vision 2040? And I worked on Vision 2040. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Wonder, I wonder how it differs. <laughs> no, so that's my change the dates. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I hope they do more than that. Does anybody else have anything for the good of the order? Well, Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah, thanks for. I mean, this year was. Well, I guess I should mention about this a little bit before, and and I have no idea who's going to be here next year. I have no idea if I'm even going to be here next year, but um, I think that the new plan going forward is that the first nine months or the first major portion of the year is going to be hard and heavy. And then the, the last couple of months of the year, probably not quite so hard. Like this year, we did a lot of work the first nine months. We did so much work that we kind of exhausted what we needed to do and we backed up the board far enough that they didn't need us to put any more on their pile. And I think that it worked out really well for us. We took a lot of time off the last quarter of the year and it would not surprise me at all if that's kind of the vision going forward. I don't know if we'll be able to maintain it, but if we can, that'd be fantastic. Um, no matter what, there's going to be a lot of new commissioners next year and getting everybody up to speed is going to be quite the challenge, but hopefully the books will do it. And of course we got great staff. Um, but uh, um, I do appreciate that everybody, I know I took some arrows for rushing things through from a few people a few different times. I still think it was worth it. I think it was worth it. I really wanted to make sure that we could get to comp plan. I'll take one of them back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even, I don't even think that they were, they were aimed wrong, but uh, <laughs> they didn't have barbs on them. Yeah, uh, I really did think that it was important to get us ready for comp plan because comp plan is going to be such a huge thing and to clear off our docket of a bunch of these smaller programs and smaller issues was important to me. So hopefully that will continue in the future. But I, I do appreciate that everybody, we did not have a whole lot of 9-0 votes or 8-0 votes um, and that's all right too, but we got a lot of stuff done and I appreciate that we were able to all get it done. And I think that we could finish off 2023 feeling pretty good about how much work we actually finished. Yeah. I'll add a statement to that, that I feel like uh, honored to work with this group of people on this planning commission. Uh, I, I know that we definitely don't agree on lots of issues, but I really respect the, uh, the legality and professionalism and, and uh, wisdom and humor and, you know, that we work well together. I feel like it's the best 
volunteer work I've done and all the different volunteer things I've done. I enjoy this planning commission the most, and I think it's because of the quality of the people here. And you know, I'll continue to fight you about everything I disagree with you on, but I totally respect you and appreciate you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I think it, I, I've said this before, and I'm full of cliches, so I apologize for that. But I think generally speaking, we probably agree on ninety eight percent of values and ninety five percent of politics. And we tend to focus on the things that uh, are in those that much smaller minority. And sometimes we have different priorities too that that can influence it. But generally speaking, we got a lot of stuff done, and we did it without anybody bleeding or crying. I think. I don't know. I <laughs> cried after a few of those. <laughs> um, Not because of the group. <laughs> so I'm grateful for that. Does anybody else have anything for the good of the order? If I think it would be really exciting next year if we do have the breathing room for the planning commission to, to be able to set it up where in those later months in the year, we can pick, we, we I'm using the role we, but you all can pick topics that you want to dive yeah. deeper into. Um, I mean, I know that the board sets a work plan, um, but I believe in continuing education and development of a stronger planning commission. So I know this was, I mean, this was just kind of a start of trying to get folks in here that aren't just staff, but um, I would hope that we expand on that um, and just build up all of our planning toolboxes. Yeah, I hope that that if we're able to plan for being able to have a little bit more flexible agenda at the end of the year, we could plan for some of these work sessions and get some other resources in here that are not necessarily directly related to the work plan in front of us. That'd be great. With uh, new folks coming in, are we allowed to haze new planning? <laughs> or only we have to reserve Check with that HR. Staff? Check with HR, but I think there's probably a policy on volunteers that would, I think you we'll know, need to. Yeah, but there's something in here about that. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything before we adjourn and stuff our faces? We're already stuffing our faces. <laughs> <laughs> well, with no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Stuffing faces is also non-debatable. <laughs> <laughs> All this cake eating is public record. <laughs> Very rich, but thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs>